The Night Beat starts right now. It's careless. It's it's reckless to um, others. And, you know, again, folks who congregate uh, may, in fact, uh, be carrying the virus and not even know it, but in, end up infecting someone they love who will die from it. So, you know, I know this is difficult. We, we, we don't take any pleasure in having to close things down temporarily, but we're trying to save lives. Pure ignorance, those words used by Mayor Ron Nuremberg tonight to describe this scene. Hundreds of protesters demonstrating on the steps of the Texas Capitol building in Austin, calling for an end to social restrictions. But it's those restrictions, including social distancing, that are helping to flatten the curve and save lives. That's according to many of the world's top health leaders, including Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is not only a renowned infectious disease expert, but a key member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. And this group in Austin today chanting, calling for him to be fired. Governor Greg Abbott did announce yesterday he plans to start easing some restrictions in the coming week. But here at home, city leaders say reopening will not happen until the right measures are in place. And that includes following social distancing guidelines as long as necessary. The night team, Stephen Cavazos, explains why more needs to be done before life can return back to normal. But what's going on outside uh, in, in these protests is pure ignorance. Mayor Ron Nirenberg criticizing protesters who rallied against stay-at-home orders. But the mayor reminding San Antonio residents... These emergency orders are emergency orders. They're temporary. This goes away when we get this under control. The mayor says his public health transition team is developing new protocols aimed at guiding city leaders through easing back into everyday life. I would say that uh, the work is absolutely critical. It's foundational to our next steps. Dr. Sharice Rohr Allegrini is a local epidemiologist and has studied infectious diseases. She says it's important to remember life won't be quick to return to normal once we reach our local peak. We're going to have to stick with the physical distancing um, as much as possible because we're going to see another peak if we're not careful. Roar Allegrini says that could mean businesses keep their current guidelines in place a little longer. We're going to have to be very careful for a long time. Mayor Ron Nirenberg says the city will not make any moves to open prematurely. He says health and safety will remain his top priority. I'll tell you as mayor, I will do everything within my authority to protect the lives of our residents. Now, we're here along the San Antonio Riverwalk, which is typically busy on the weekends, but just take a look. This is what the area has looked like for almost a month now. Now, the mayor, did, now it's not clear yet when we will actually see people returning to these businesses, but the mayor did add again that the decision to reopen the city will re rely on the help of medical experts who right now are still collecting that data. Reporting live on the San Antonio Riverwalk, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Tim Jaffney. Stephen, thank you. And that brings us to the latest local numbers. The mayor announcing tonight 992 positive cases of COVID-19 in Bear County, along with 38 deaths, nearly half of those deaths happening at the Southeast Nursing Home and Rehabilitation Center. On the other end of the spectrum, more than 250 have fully recovered. Meanwhile, across Texas tonight, we are now well beyond 18,000 positive cases and more than 450 deaths. More than 4,800 people, though, have recovered. And while that number is comforting, it's important to keep in mind that Texas hospitals are still treating more than 1,300 positive patients. To a developing story now, a police officer is dead tonight following a shooting in San Marcos. According to the city of San Marcos, a man fatally shot the officer and injured two more officers at the Twin Lake Villa apartments on Hunter Road. Police report that suspect then turned the gun on himself and is now dead. According to the city, the officers were responding to an assault at the apartment complex when they were ambushed by the suspect who reportedly carried a rifle. The other two officers who were hurt were taken to the hospital and had to undergo surgery. Their condition is unknown. KSAT has a crew at the scene trying to gather more information. We'll bring you the latest updates online and tomorrow morning on GMSA. So awful just the heartbreak just to have to bury my my son, my only son. Emotional words coming from this San Antonio mother whose son was killed by a wrong way drunk driver. 21 year old Christopher Farias Jr. was hit head on by 60 year old Hector Osorio, who police say was drunk. Farias' mother tells me that her son had a great soul and that she hopes Osorio pays for the pain he's caused. He's not gonna be able to grow older and get married and have kids or 
experienced anything like that. Veronica Farias prayed the young man killed by a wrong way driver Wednesday night was not her son, 21 year old Christopher Farias Jr. I don't know, I just felt like something's wrong. Sadly, she learned while her son was on his way to visit a friend, 60 year old cardiologist Hector Osorio crashed head on into Christopher on I-37 South after sideswiping another car. Boy, when he saw the lights, like how scared he must have been or he didn't have time to react and just not being able to be there for him. Christopher, or CJ, was known as a gentle giant and loving teddy bear. He would pick us up and hold us till we couldn't breathe and we're banging on his back saying, let me go, let me go. And I just wish I could just feel that hug again and not ever, just tell him, don't ever let go. One thing he would always tell me was like, I got you, mom, I got you. Don't worry about it. He would always say that to me. His family says he was goofy. I'm going to get paid tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow night, mom. Wing stop, wing stop on me. And love to dance. <laughs> they say without his presence, their home is filled with silence. He was my big brother, my only brother. And life is going to be so different without him. Osoria was arrested for intoxication manslaughter. Veronica says she hopes this will keep him off the roads. He could have not only just taken my son's life that night, but others as well. He deserves to be punished for what he did. Hector Osorio was also convicted back in 2018 for driving while intoxicated. His bond for his most recent charge, intoxication manslaughter, was set at $150,000. He has since bonded out of jail. Take a look at other stories we've been following today. Major water damage to multiple apartments following a shooting overnight. That shooting happening just before 2.30 this morning at an apartment complex on Sahara Drive. San Antonio police say a bullet hit a water line which caused the flooding. Police also say they found a man and woman believed to be under the influence of drugs. The man is believed to be the shooting in that sus uh, the suspect in that shooting rather. He's facing a charge of deadly conduct. No one was injured by the gunfire. No one was hurt following a house fire on the south side last night. The fire breaking out around 1130 on Mary Street. San Antonio fire officials say an overloaded power outlet shorted out, causing a nearby mattress to catch fire. The fire was contained to just one bedroom. Three people were home at the time, but again, none were injured. A little taste of fall out there today. Cloudy and cool. We're sitting at 60 degrees, and as you can see, visibility is down a lot this evening. We've got some low clouds producing drizzle and also some fog developing across South Texas, and things are going to stay pretty messy out there for the rest of the night through early tomorrow morning. So 60 degrees at the airport. Our dew point is up in the upper 50s. Those two numbers close together. That's what's helping some of that patchy fog to develop, and it'll hang around. Uh, all night and look at the visibility now off to the uh, east of I-35. That's where we have our lowest visibility numbers at this time. One and a half miles in Gonzales uh, down below half a mile in Beeville. We'll continue to see this fog fill in off to the west of the I-35 corridor tonight, but things are really going to improve quickly tomorrow and you're going to want to crank the AC by tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, we've got some big weather changes coming in the next day or so. We'll talk about all that coming up in the full forecast. Tim. Thank you very much, Katie. Local food banks are stepping up amid a time of growing uncertainty as to where a family's next meal might come from. More than 50 volunteers dedicated some of their time this morning to help feed at least 500 households most impacted by COVID-19 in Kendall County. Those volunteers, along with the San Antonio Food Bank, Hill Country Family Services and Comfort Table and Food Pantry, were out at Bernie Champion High School at 10 a.m. to kick off today's food giveaway event. Organizers say they saw a steady stream of vehicles throughout that event, many of which had been lined up for several hours before the start. We were really worried because in San Antonio, they've been seeing 10,000 people show up for mobile mega food distributions. And to be quite honest, the needs in Bear County, just based on, um, on their population numbers, superseded our needs here in Kittle County. But we worked together and we made it happen and we're thrilled. If you live in Kendall County and are in need of assistance, you can call Hill Country Family Services, their number 830-249-8643.
Demand for food and supplies also high in Atascosa County, where another food drive was held this morning. Vehicles began lining up at 2 a.m. outside the Atascosa County Courthouse, winding through neighborhoods for at least two miles. San Antonio Food Bank once again providing for this drive, partnering with the county and First Baptist Church Jordington. I hope that when we're uh, a couple of months from now, when things are getting better, that this community spirit continues. It's a wonderful thing. Now, if you are in need, the San Antonio Food Bank is one of your most valuable resources. You can register to receive meals and supplies through their website. We provided a link to it at ksat.com. From protests to a lack of testing to food shortage scares, there's no shortage of coronavirus coming still coming your way tonight. Up next, the very latest on how the U.S. is handling the pandemic, plus a look at tonight's One World Together at Home special. It's not just Texas. Protesters in several states now calling for stay-at-home orders to be lifted. Some governors actually beginning to ease those restrictions, while some governors believe the key to getting back to normal will be more testing. But many states still have still say they don't have enough of those tests. Here's Mark Stewart with the details. As the federal government and governors lay out new guidelines for reopening the economy, frustrated residents in several states continue to take to the streets in protest, anxious to get back to work. In Maryland and Ohio, and in Texas, where the governor has begun easing some restrictions, retail stores are being allowed to reopen with delivery or curbside pickup, and elective surgeries will resume next week. In Florida, beaches in Jacksonville once again open to the public with several restrictions. Governor DeSantis now forming a task force to handle reopening the Sunshine State. We want to continue with Florida's economic development strategy. We had a lot of great irons in the fire before this hit, and we want to be able to get that uh, back going forward. But health officials continue to stress the importance of social distancing. What this graph illustrates is the amazing work of the American people to really adhere to social distancing. They were able to decrease the number of cases so that in general, most of the metro areas never had an issue of complete crisis care of all of their hospitals in a region. However, a key hurdle for reopening large portions of the country comes down to testing. Roughly three and a half million Americans have been screened for COVID. That's only 1% of the population. Tonight, California's governor says the state doesn't have enough nose swabs. We could be doing exponentially more, get up to 90, he believes 95,000 tests a day if we had those additional supply materials. Texas, with a population of 29 million people, ranks worse, 49th per capita. And for the millions of Americans who continue to stay at home, an evening of entertainment for a cause. A benefit concert sponsored by the World Health Organization, airing on all three major networks. Mark Stewart, ABC News, New York. Meanwhile, it was a, another gray Saturday out there, but uh, warmer things on the way. Yes, definitely. I tell you, it was chilly, and I found out because I woke up and my throat was ashy today, and that's how I knew <laughs> the temperatures had dropped. Something was going on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we had a front come in yesterday evening, and Tim was saying this earlier. You could tell right away when it came in because you kind of felt some of that drier air filtering in, and it did get a little bit cooler. And today, a nice little taste of fall, but... Man, we're going to turn things around really quickly on you tomorrow. We're going to try to squeeze in several seasons here this weekend. Here were your high temperatures today. Average high in San Antonio this time of year is around 81. We were some almost 20 degrees cooler than that this afternoon. But places that got to clear out and see a little bit of sunshine today, like Del Rio, you were able to warm up into the upper 70s, low 80s. Here is where we will be tomorrow afternoon. Thanks to some dry air working in and a lot of sunshine heading your way for the end of the weekend. Nothing like a casual 30 degree temperature swing for you in a matter of a day. So get ready for a much warmer day tomorrow. Before we get there, we do have to get through some lower visibility and just some kind of yuckiness out there tonight. This is the view at the airport. We've got some light rain, some drizzle that has been around for the past several hours. Visibility here in San Antonio is OK right now, but I do think we could see that number drop a bit through the overnight hours. Temperatures across the board 
few low 70s off to the west, but most of us are in the 60s, ranging from the upper 60s down closer to the coast to the low 60s here in the Alamo City and up in the Hill Country. Our dew point numbers are not too far removed from our air temperatures, so when that happens, that's when we see some fog begin to develop, and the lowest visibilities now generally are east of 35, but New Braunfels, you just dropped down below a mile, and these visibilities are changing. Uh, every few minutes here again, four miles here in San Antonio, but down below two miles out in Uvalde. So we'll continue to see this patchy fog develop off to the west through the overnight hours. So tonight while you're sleeping, things aren't going to change a whole lot. It'll stay cloudy and damp out there with some drizzle and fog possible through dawn tomorrow morning. Also around dawn tomorrow morning, that's when we have a chance at an isolated shower or non severe thunderstorm, and then things will clear out very quickly. We will lose the cloud cover. I think even by mid morning, we're looking at a good amount of sunshine, certainly by lunchtime, mostly sunny skies. And then as some drier air works in a west wind tomorrow afternoon, that's what helps to send our high temperatures into the upper 80s and low 90s. So we are in the warm sector of a surface low pressure system that is building off of the Rockies tonight. That's why things are kind of damp out there. We've got the drizzle. We've got the fog. Any real measurable rain has worked well off to our northeast tonight, but this low pressure system tonight and during the day tomorrow is going to move off to the east as it does. So it will really start to gain some momentum. So that's going to set up another unfortunately severe weather event in the deep south tomorrow. We are not concerned about severe weather here in South Texas. We'll be on the kind of quiet end of this system as we head into the day tomorrow. But nonetheless, we could see a few showers and non severe thunderstorms pop up very early tomorrow morning. I actually think the best chance to see some measurable rain will be east of 35 on the coastal bend and in our easternmost counties, anywhere from Gonzales over to Hallettsville. A few rumbles of thunder early tomorrow morning. Then that rain will move out and everyone will see a lot of sunshine as we head into the afternoon. So the sun will help to warm us up, but something else that will really help to warm us up tomorrow. That's going to be some dry air working in behind the dry dry line will really start to see our dew point numbers fall off tomorrow afternoon, and it's going to be that drier air along with the sunshine that helps our high temperatures climb into the low 90s tomorrow. And after a really cool week this past week, I've got upper 80s, low 90s for you all week long. A chance of some showers and thunderstorms returns late Tuesday into Wednesday. Girl, Guys. we just been on a roller coaster. I'm looking forward to this this steady, at least warmer weather period. <laughs> It's going down. All right, Katie, thanks. Certainly, we're not a lot of highlights for the Spurs this year. Perhaps <laughs> it's good that the season ended early, but even so, ESPN giving props to one of our players for one of the best plays of the year. Yeah, you know, we're having a tough time filling five and six minute yes. sports casts. ESPN must be having a really difficult time, but out of it, they are giving DeMar DeRozan some love for the top play of the year when it comes to NBA. Plus, did the Dallas Cowboys interview a quarterback because of Dak Prescott's contract situation? Coming up. Ever since I've been in the league, I've always had that chip. And my biggest thing is I just want to get back to 2016, if not better than 2016 uh, season, you know. Um, and I think the biggest thing is everyone knows is uh, just staying healthy. In 2016, David Johnson produced his best season in the NFL, topping 1,200 yards rushing, earning him his lone Pro Bowl nod. Now he wants to do even better for the Houston Texans and big board sports. All right, when it comes to the top plays in the NBA this season, DeMar DeRozan's slam dunk in Toronto grabs the number one spot according to ESPN. It happened January 12th, Spurs at the Raptors. DeRozan drives the lane and abuses Chris Boucher. DeRozan received a technical for allegedly taunting Boucher after the jam, which the NBA later rescinded. DeRozan scored 25 points that night to help the Spurs win 105-104, with that jam being the highlight. The NBA playoffs were scheduled to start today, but COVID-19 wiped it out. When and if play resumes, we don't know if the league will finish the regular season or go straight to the playoffs. Yesterday, after the NBA Board of Governors meeting held via video conference, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver said there is still too much uncertainty to make any decisions. Mavericks owner Mark Cuban agrees. I hope so, uh, but we're going to do what's best for everybody. I mean, it's going to be safety first, and we'll defer to scientists and the doctors. I mean, there's nothing else we can do. Silver also said the number of NBA players who have tested positive for COVID-19 is greater than the initial report of seven. The league did not disclose how many or who due to privacy reasons, but Silver said all the players are staying home as instructed.
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Just like the rest of the NFL, the Dallas Cowboys are holding virtual interviews of 2020 draft prospects and posting some short clips online. One segment that really stood out was the Cowboys talking with Oklahoma Sooners quarterback Jalen Hurts. During a radio interview yesterday with 105.3 to fan, Stephen Jones was asked if chatting with Hurts has anything to do with Dak's contract situation. I don't think it has anything to do with Dak's uh, contract in terms of uh, our interest in a quarterback. I think we're big believers. You know, Mike was up in Green Bay where they continually uh, drafted quarterbacks uh, up there. Uh, we're always looking uh, to get better. Obviously, we've had uh, Cooper Rush around here uh, going into his fourth season, and uh, you know he'll be he'll be free next year. So, uh, you know, we're always looking uh, to have uh, a good uh, backup situation, especially if it's a you know a young player who can develop come in here. I think you're going down the wrong path when you equate it to a uh, Dak situation. Running back David Johnson is ready to join the Houston Texans once NFL facilities open up. After five seasons with the Cardinals, they traded Johnson to Houston for DeAndre Hopkins. When he first heard about the trade, what was his initial reaction? I was on vacation with my family, my wife and kid, uh, kids. And we were very excited, uh, a new beginning. And like I've been saying, Texans are always in the playoffs, um, a very successful team. And then, you know, they have weapons all over. And so I was very, very um, excited to be a part of that organization, very thankful, um, talking to Bill O'Brien and, and the way he wants to utilize me um, and talking to the running backs coach. And I talked to a lot of guys in the front office. Pro baseball in Taiwan is underway where they are playing games with mannequins and cardboard cutouts in the stands. It is a sight to see for sure. And guys, we'll have that coming up later in sports. Uh, I want baseball back badly, but I don't know if I want to see mannequins in the stands. It'd be hard to harass the Astros like that. Right. Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. President Trump announcing a $19 billion relief package to assist American farmers who have been financially hurt by the coronavirus pandemic. And as farmers are struggling, so are many American families. With 22 million people filing for unemployment across the past few weeks, food insecurity is on the rise. Here's ABC's Diane Macedo with the details. With schools and businesses closed across the country and at least 22 million Americans filing for unemployment in the last three weeks, many are struggling to put food on the table. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio toured a temporary food distribution center in the Bronx today, days after announcing a $170 million initiative to feed every New Yorker who needs help during the pandemic. What we're seeing all over this city is the deepest kind of need, and it came on so suddenly. It's like nothing we have ever seen in generations in this city. There are a lot of people right now who are hungry. At the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, thousands lined up for food distribution. There's a lot of people hurting out here. You know, a lot of people, even in my, in, within my family. Nobody likes it when your kids ask what's for dinner and you're not sure what to tell them. In Riverside, California, the Women, Infants and Children program, which helps supplement groceries for pregnant women, new moms and young children, says demand is on the rise. We have seen a lot of requests come through our website and through the phone system. Arkansas even has a COVID-19 food access map, listing information on farms, local businesses, restaurants, and organizations offering free meals. We're all in an, in an uncertain time, and we're really excited that this is one thing that we can do to step into the, the realm to hopefully alleviate concern around where to find food. And in Houston, a United Airlines baggage handler is now leading a company-wide effort to transform empty cargo facilities into food distribution centers. Diane Macedo, ABC News, New York. Officials from the Food and Drug Administration are now explaining the lag in coronavirus testing here in the U.S. They tell CNN the problem was how the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention initially manufactured that test. The FDA says it sent an official to the Atlanta-based agency in February when issues arose with the testing kits. Working together, the FDA and CDC determined the design of the test was fine. An FDA official, though, said the CDC had appeared to violate its own manufacturing protocol and the tests had become contaminated. 
Dogs have been used for decades to sniff out drugs, bombs, and even illness like cancer. And now a team of British researchers are hoping their keen sense of smell can help detect COVID-19. The London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is working with specially trained dogs. The training began in March after researchers found dogs can detect malaria infections. If their testing proves true, dogs could be deployed to screen people for the virus, but won't replace tra traditional testing. The dogs could be used at airports or other public areas to help prevent another outbreak. The CEO of Netflix has donated $30 million toward the research for a coronavirus vaccine. Reed Hastings and his wife Patty Quillen gave the money to Gavi Alliance, a nonprofit immunization organization founded by the Bill Gates Foundation. That's according to Variety. The funds will be reportedly spent on speeding up the COVID-19 vaccine development and will help distribute it once it's uh, available. Gavi Alliance's goal is to raise $7.4 billion. The nonprofit wants to immunize 300 million children over the next five years. San Diego Comic-Con has been canceled for the first time in its 50-year history. Losing Comic-Con 2020 means a big financial loss. Total regional impact in San Diego will be a loss of about $166 million. Earlier this week, San Diego's mayor announced a budget proposal for the next fiscal year beginning in July and involved a number of cuts in spending and positions to make up for unexpected or for expected losses related to Comic-Con. Comic-Con plans to return in 2021. People still want to look good even if they aren't leaving their houses. That's according to L'Oreal, the world's largest cosmetic company, which says the demand for beauty products remains strong. L'Oreal pointed to increased sales in China while that nation was in the middle of a shutdown. The company says it has seen an increase in online sales and in, in China and across the world. Skin care and hair care products seem to be the most in demand, especially hair dye. Me and myself, I could just use a haircut. <laughs> Still ahead on the night beat, the coronavirus pandemic only putting pressure on the housing market. And look at how that's affecting what's normally the best time to buy. That's next. Spring is typically the kickoff of the hot home buying season, but what about this year? For sellers, the pandemic adds even more stress to the process. And as Swelling Your Sides, Marilyn Moore tells us for realtors, it means doing things differently. It was completely updated. For sale, a charming 1910 craftsman. Chase Bartlett and his wife listed it late February. We had a lot of good interest at the beginning, and it, <laughs> a lot of people, it seems like they obviously have bigger things to deal with. March sales for San Antonio actually showed a modest 4% increase over the year before. Median prices were also up 6%, but that was largely before the pandemic moved in. We're still doing business, though. It's just different the way we have to do it. We're going to go in the house now. For real estate agent Matt Till, that means virtual open houses on Zoom. The master bathroom, again, really cute uh, vintage look tile. And taking prospective nice buyers on live video tours. I've sold a few homes sight unseen based on FaceTime. In-person showings mean disinfectants and differences. We're now asking the sellers uh, before they leave, if the house is occupied, that they turn on all the lights for us. They open any interior doors so we don't really have to touch doorknobs. Economists say that April and May numbers will be much more telling for the housing market, adding that pent up sales could just mean a huge summer. As for Bartlett, he needs to move to L.A. soon. We're already kind of in a position where we're going to be paying for a mortgage here and, and rent there at least for a month or two. Of course, we're nervous. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Outside with live cam, not the prettiest view tonight. We've got some low clouds. We've got some fog around. It's just kind of damp and muggy out there. 60 degrees at the airport. And I love this KSAC Connect picture. This was sent to us this evening. Uh, the view of the tower. And you can always tell when those cloud uh, ceilings are beginning to lower when the top of the Tower of the Americas, the view there begins to become obstructed. We've had those low clouds really starting to set in. That has produced some drizzle tonight. We've also got some fog out there. So early tomorrow, Tomorrow morning, the weather's still going to be a bit messy. We'll have some fog drizzle, maybe even a shower through about 7, 8 o'clock. But after that, mid-morning tomorrow, things are going to clear out and it'll be a great time to get outside before things really start to heat up by tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, we've got a whole nother season on the way tomorrow. We'll talk about it and I'll get you your full forecast coming up next. 
I've now lived in San Antonio long enough to know that when we get weather like we just had this week in April, you cherish it because it might be till October before we see temps like that again. I know, <laughs> I know. I, yeah, we've had this nice cool week last week. Looking ahead to next week, kind of going the opposite direction. Temperature will be trending above average and that means upper 80s low 90s so yeah get ready for some changes right now we've got a low pressure system a surface low coming off of the Rockies several facets to this low pressure system we've got the warm front and south of that warm front that's the warm sector that's where we are right now and while it's not necessarily warm out there it is muggy we've got winds becoming southerly uh, and some uh, surface moisture is building in tonight we've got the dry line this is what will be moving through tomorrow and that separates very humid air which is what we're sitting in right now from some drier air and there's also a cold front much farther off to the north there but this surface low is going to bring unfortunately another Another round of severe weather to portions of the deep south as we get into the day tomorrow. So this low is still kind of winding itself up tonight, but as it makes some eastward progress, taps into some very unstable air across parts of Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama. Those states are looking at another round of severe weather. This is very similar to the setup that was in place last Sunday, Easter Sunday, when there were um, all those tornado reports across the deep south. So portions of Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama in that deep red color there, that is a four on a one to five scale for severe weather risks. So they're looking at all modes of severe weather tomorrow, damaging straight line winds, large hail and unfortunately tornadoes. But we're on the quiet side of things here tomorrow morning. Our far eastern counties, Gonzales County, Lavaca County. Technically, you're at a two on this one to five scale, but I really think that storms will just be starting to gather strength as they're moving through some of our easternmost counties mid morning tomorrow. It's when they get off closer to the Houston area and then into far east Texas that they'll really start to ramp up. So I am not overly concerned about severe weather in the KSAP viewing area tomorrow morning. Some small hail maybe for some of our easternmost communities is not out of the question. But here in San Antonio, we're just looking at a quick hitting passing shower early tomorrow morning between about 5 and 7 a.m. We get to 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. That's when places like Gonzales over to Hallettsville and Lavaca County, even DeWitt County could hear a few rumbles of thunder, maybe some small hail, but then it'll be later in the morning and into the afternoon that those storms really start to misbehave a little bit more off in far east Texas. And by tomorrow afternoon here at home, we're just looking at a lot of sunshine. Before we get there, though, we will have to contend with some low visibility tonight, even since I showed you the visibility map last half hour. Some of these numbers have dropped a bit. We're down to two and a half mile visibility in Gonzales, three quarter mile visibility in New Braunfels. Things haven't changed much here in San Antonio, but as we head through the overnight hours, some fog will certainly be possible and some of that drizzle will hang around as well. Temperatures generally in the 60s right now, and that's about where our dew point temperatures are. So with those numbers being so close together, our winds fairly light. That's what's contributing to the fog out there. So we're going to clear out really quickly tomorrow. We'll see some sun in the afternoon but what's really going to help to push our temperatures up there. That is some drier air that will work in behind the dry line tomorrow afternoon. So we'll see our dew point temperatures that are in the 60s for the most part. Now drop into the 40s tomorrow afternoon. It'll feel nice out there. Even Monday dew points will stay pretty low, but we will see them pick back up Tuesday into Wednesday before another little drop. So as we're looking ahead to our high temperatures next week, they're generally going to be in the upper 80s, low 90s, but it won't be overly muggy. We'll have a couple of humid days in there, but for the most part, it won't be too humid out there. So tonight temperatures staying about where they are right now. Fog drizzle continues a shower, maybe a rumble of thunder right around dawn and then plenty of clearing, mostly sunny tomorrow afternoon with a high temperature right around 90. It'll be Tuesday into Wednesday that humidity picks back up a little bit, and so it could feel pretty steamy out there for a couple of hours as we get into Tuesday and Wednesday afternoons. Other than that, we'll see some drier air filter back in for the end of the week. Definitely Guys. looking forward to some of that sunshine, Katie. Thank yes. you. Heading over to sports, what's going down? Thanks to Taiwan, we <laughs> now have an idea what baseball might look like without fans if it comes back this year, and it's weird. It is weird. <laughs> it definitely could work, but you know it has to be weird for the baseball players to be in a stadium where there's no fans and no one chasing home run balls. Coming up, Taiwan baseball, they're four or five games into the season. No fans in the stands, plus a local QB coach is still teaching and keeping his guys sharp. Coming up.
I think we have a uh, mission to to bring the comfort or bring the excitement or or just to bring a, uh, to provide a way out for people out there. Baseball commentator Richard Wang is calling games in Taiwan, trying to provide an escape for sports fans during the pandemic. But the stands are filled with dummies and big board sports. Back in the day, Josh Atkins would attend Larry Coker's UTSA football camps, and now Josh is a member of the Roadrunners. Talk about coming full circle. After redshirting in 2017, he started 22 games at quarterback for New Mexico State the past two seasons and threw for 5,100 yards, 27 touchdowns, completing nearly 60% of his passes. Today we FaceTime with his new head coach, Jeff Trailer, who knows Josh can throw the ball with the best of them. Ball accuracy, you know, he, uh, he's accurate with the football. He's played a lot of football. Uh, he makes quick decisions. He's a better athlete than people think he is. You know, he can run around with his feet. So uh, a lot of experience, a lot of character, a lot of IQ. Uh, loves UTSA. Uh, loves San Antonio. He's really good friends with Frank, who's another quarterback he'll be competing with, who I'm very high on as well. And I know that he'll get along with Lowell and Sutton and JoJo. And when I can find IQ and character and guys that make our roster better, we have to take those guys on our team especially if they're from San Antonio area. Coach Trailer got a verbal commitment from another outstanding local player, offensive lineman Cameron Scott from Judson High School. That's six verbals in 24 hours. Local QB coach Yale Vinoy is as busy as usual despite football being shut down by the virus. Yale is one of the best teachers out there and he works with some of the top quarterbacks in the area like Ty Reasoner, Cannon Williams, Levi Williams and Josh Atkins, just to name a handful. But COVID-19 means he can't meet the guys on the field and work with them in person. So he's going the virtual route to teach his young guns. We'll do a lot of film study. We'll actually do some FaceTime and Zoom calls. Of the guys will be out, you know, uh, at their house uh, doing some mechanical work and I'll take them through our, our pre-practice uh, uh, routine and, and make sure everything is, is looking in line. Once again, the thing for athletes is they're so focused on schedule and routine, schedule and routine. So the quicker that we can get them back into a, a schedule and a routine that works for them and makes sense for them, I, I don't think we'll lose too much ground. Another one of Yale students, Lucas Coley from Cornerstone High School, class of 2021, now has 30 college offers, including two from Power 5 schools, Arkansas and Washington State. Indy car racing this afternoon at a virtual twin ring, Motegi in Japan. Two-time NASCAR Cup Series champion Kyle Busch joined the fun and he finished 13th. Late in the race, Will Power and Scott McLaughlin are neck and neck, but McLaughlin loses control and spins into the wall. Next, Simon Pagano makes a move for the lead, bumping power out of the way, and for the second straight week, Pagano wins an iRacing event. The coronavirus hasn't stopped pro baseball in Taiwan. The racketeen monkeys placed dummies and cardboard cutouts of fans complete with face masks in the stands for a game against the Fubon Guardians on Friday, at least filling some seats as the team's cheerleaders tried their best to inspire the players and audiences at home. For the first time in 30 years, baseball games from Taiwan are being broadcast with English commentary and streamed online for free to audiences abroad via social media. And hey, if you're really Jones and for some baseball, <laughs> it's not a bad way I, to I take it that watch. nobody will be able to catch any home run balls. <laughs> no, they games. still charge the mannequins $12 a beer <laughs> and $30 for parking. <laughs> oh my God. Gotta make money. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with us. Well-known friends could help. The Disney Bedtime Hotline is back. Fans can hear a bedtime message from one of five Disney characters. That's Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, Daisy Duck, or Goofy. To hear a message, all you have to do is dial one 877 mickey and select the character you want to hear from. I'll try not to tie up the lines because I want to talk to Goofy. I love that laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I know the weather. Good for adults, yeah. too, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> A much different day tomorrow. Whole new day, whole new season. How about that? It'll be really warm all next week. Don't know how to say anything, but good night. <laughs> Have a good one.